I'm sure if you're like me and you live here in the state of California, you receive a monthly reminder about how much you are dependent on electricity. I'm sure that reminder is a very expensive reminder that shows up every month to let you know, hey, in order for you to live, you need this power to essentially run your lives. You get that as a constant reminder. But then there's some of you out there who think that you've cheated the system, you've cracked the code, you've hacked it, and you got solar, right? You're just solar evangelists. You can't talk about anything but the solar panels that you got that enable you to essentially make money on the system. And actually, after having listened to a number of people talk about the solar power that they have, uh, it's convincing. Like, it seems like they've figured out how to cheat the system and they have this great solar power. Interestingly enough, though, there was a man who tried to take advantage of that. Do you know the name uh, Steve Commissar? or commissar, depending on how you pronounce it. I think it was here in California. He got this trend. He saw that everybody wanted to have this solar power. So he put an ad out there, and the ad said this. For $49.99, I will sell you a solar-powered clothes dryer. I will sell you a solar-powered clothes dryer. And everyone goes, that's fantastic. Like, you know how much the electric... Uh, clothes dryers cost and they get plugged into the wall. Solar powered one, that's amazing for $49.99. That's incredible. I want to be able to have that panel draw it from the sun so it powers my clothes dryer right there. So they paid it, they sent it out to them and do you know what he sent back to them? A cord for a hanger outside. A solar powered clothes dryer because their clothes would be dried by the power of the sun. Some of you are now getting what just took place in that. He tried to cheat the system by getting them to say, oh, I need this type of power. And then he gave them something that wasn't the type of efficient power that they wanted. It was a a fake. When there's a promise of power and it's not delivered upon, it can bring a lot of despair to a person's life. And I think it's like that in the Christian life as well. Remember, we're talking about the Christian life, not how you become a Christian. In the book of Romans, we've seen very clearly how anybody becomes a Christian. How does a human being who's been separated from God because of their sins become a Christian? And that is simply by grace through faith. There is no works. There's no effort. Nothing you can do can make you right with God. You believe in the work of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. The perfect life that he lived can stand in your place because he died the death you deserved and lived the life you've been called to live. That's how you become a Christian. But when you live the Christian life, you need power. It must be given to you. The strength you have is not found inward in yourself. It must be a a foreign and alien power outside of you that's given to you, that is promised, that is empowering your every step of obedience. And in the Christian life, that's the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about sanctification since we started Romans chapter 6. Sanctification, the, the, the participation of the plodding towards the perfecting grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We get to plod together as saints, side by side, as we work towards becoming more like Jesus Christ. But it's not because we're so great. It's because we are given the strength of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. That's a key theme that I want you to keep in mind this morning because the Apostle Paul is going to make sure we understand that as we turn to a new section in the book of Romans. Turn with me to Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. We finished our time in Romans chapter 6, which for myself, I know, was just a huge encouragement to my own sanctification to literally, when I do my spiritual disciplines, tell God I'm presenting myself to you because I understand me to be your slave doing your will and I want to accomplish it for your glory. It's an incredible thought to think that God gives us the privilege to serve him as his slaves and that's what Romans chapter six is about. But we're going to continue the theme of sanctification into Romans chapter 7. And I will warn you up front, it is a very controversial portion of scripture with differing ideas. And so we're going to take our time to walk through it. But the first six verses are really an incredible argument from the Apostle Paul. Listen to what he says in Romans chapter 6, verses 1, uh, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. He writes this, or do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. That the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. 
For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but if her husband dies, she's free from the law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we may serve in the new way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. Why are you able to do what God calls you to do? And make no mistake about it, he calls you to do it as the king of the universe. And it's not an option for you to go, uh, I'd like to do it or not. The king commands and he wants you to live it out. And how do you have the power to do so? Because you are under a new rule. The old rule that had hold over you did not empower you with the right energy and the right passion to do what God wants you to do. You lived for yourself. You lived according to the flesh. But now God in the new covenant has given us the Holy Spirit so that we might walk in the way that he wants us to walk and do the things that he wants us to do. But why is Paul contrasting that with the law right now? One of the benefits of doing consecutive Bible exposition that we do here at the church is you get to watch brilliant arguments unfold And Paul, in Romans, is doing a masterful job. Do you remember what he said at the end of Romans 5? He said that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What a profound statement with so much in it that he realizes the impact of this needs to be discussed. And so the topic of grace, which is so illuminating in the life of a believer needs to be addressed because if it's misunderstood or misapplied, you might think it doesn't matter how I live if I'm saved by grace. But the Bible makes it abundantly clear. If the grace of God has saved you, it has made you a slave to God. That's what Romans 6 is all about. 6, 1 to 23. What type of grace do we have? Does that allow us to continue in sin? No, we live to be obedient to God. That's what grace does. But did you remember in 520, one verse before that, this is what Paul said. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. And Paul says that and almost essentially walks away as if it's no big deal. But that's a major deal. The law of God came in and increased sin in the life of people? Paul, what are you saying? That something God gave us is causing us to sin More? How can that be, Paul? I know my Bible. I understand Exodus 20. When God demands my holiness, he gives me the law. Therefore, how can you say that the law increases the trespass? But Paul is not in the business of leaving that aside and just walking away. He's now reintroducing the subject to us in Romans chapter 7. And now he's going to begin to explain how the law impacts human beings, mankind created in the image of God, and I believe how the law interacts with a believer. And we always want to make sure that we rightly understand the way that we interact with the law of God. So through Romans chapter 7, we're going to be able to find out, I think, the way that God wants and expects a Christian to interact with the law. What exactly does that mean? And at the beginning here in verses 1 to 6, Paul lays it out beautifully. How can a believer be sure that when he interacts with the law of God, he will not approach legalistically to do what he wants to do to get himself praise and righteousness? How can a believer be sure that he will not approach the law legalistically? Or how can a believer be sure that he will not approach the law licentiously or lawlessly, meaning I'm just going to 
throw the law aside and not even deal with it. The way that they do that is understanding what it means to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ, empowered by the spirit of God. And when you begin to understand that, you will not tend towards legalism or lawlessness. You will follow the lordship of Jesus Christ because the spirit of God is interested in one thing, the glory of Christ. Look at how he presents this in verse one of chapter seven. Do you not know, brothers, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as he lives. How does Paul start the argument again? Do you not know? How many times do I have to get up here in the pulpit and plead with you guys to say, if you think Christianity is a mindless religion based on your feelings and what you want to do, you're a fool. He's always appealing to their knowledge, things that they should know. The essence of the Christian life is to respond to the knowledge of the one true God and to have eternal life and to grow in that knowledge as you become more like God's son. He said it all throughout chapter six. Do you not know? Do you not know? And again here, do you not know? Remember those four R's we said as believers, we are either realizing something in new knowledge, we are reinforcing something that we should have comprehensive knowledge on. We should repent of something if we've not lived up to the knowledge we have, or we should rejoice in the knowledge that we have and live it for the glory of God. He's making that same appeal here, but notice what he says. There's going to be a lot of parallels between Romans 6 and Romans 7. There's a lot of similar arguments there, but there is one thing that is very different in this passage. Do you know what it is? Look at verse 1. Do you not know? What's he say? Brothers. Why is Paul talking about brothers now? Do you know throughout the, his epistles, like if you read Paul's epistles, typically throughout, he's making an appeal to the familial nature of Christianity. You and I are in the family of God by the grace of God, the adoptive heritage that we've received because God loved us in Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, we're brothers, brothers, brothers. But where's that been in Romans? From chapter 118, when he started his argument, all the way to 7-1, do you know how many times he said it? Zero. Why isn't he calling us brothers? In fact, the last time that he said it was in chapter one. Why don't you flip back there with me? One eleven. That's the last time Paul made emphasis of this idea of brotherhood. Romans chapter one, look at verse 11. And listen to what this brotherhood causes for him. He says this, for I long to see you, Romans 1.11, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I've often intended to come to you, that I might reap some harvest among you as of the rest of the Gentiles. Now, if you remember, when we started this series back in Romans and we were going through this section, this highlights something very important for us. Paul says, I long to be with you. I've tried to do that. You guys are my brothers. We're a family. And the important thing about us being together in person relationship is that that's how we impart spiritual gifts to one another. To be a part of the family of God is to be given a spiritual gift. And every believer has one. And the way that Christians are able to endure in the Christian life is when we come together and participate, giving my spiritual gift to you and your spiritual gift to me so that we build one another up. And notice what Paul says. It's not good enough to do it at a distance. When Paul writes a letter, he realizes the inadequacy of doing this far away. In fact, he says, I need to come to you so we can be encouraged that way. That's why Zoom church will never work. If the pandemic taught us anything, it taught us that, right? While we figured out what was going on, it was necessary just to keep us connected, but the body of Christ must always be together because without the mutual encouragement of one another, a part of the body of Christ, which Jesus is the head, we cannot grow. We'll talk more about this later on when we get to Romans 12 because it's about spiritual gifts. But consider 
when we say things like, hey, join a small group, come to a dwell richly, get in partners, we're trying to put people in person with one another to do this as a family. Go back to Romans 7. Notice it's not just verse 1. He repeats it again in verse 4. Likewise, my brothers. I think Paul, as he's getting into a very difficult section, is reminding them again of the family nature of the body of Christ. You have to be present in order to be blessed and to bless others with the spiritual gift God has given you. Notice he says this, my brothers, and I'm speaking to those who know the law. What is that statement all about? Speaking to those who know the law? Well, very interestingly, the word the is not there in the original language. It's just those who know law. And that's making it general. There are some who think that that means it's just simply the Mosaic law, but I don't think that that's it. I think Paul's about to set up an argument and he just wants to think about the concept of law in general. What does the concept of law mean to people? And we've made the argument in Romans that the unbelieving Gentiles know the law of God. How do they do that? They see it in creation. They have it on on their conscience. They understand Romans 132 that what they do wrong deserves punishment from some authority, but they're going to continue to do it anyway. So they know the idea of law. There is an abiding authority over them and they owe allegiance to that authority, but they don't care about that and they're going to move it on. So from creation and conscience, the unbelieving Gentile knows that. But how does the Israelite know law very explicitly. And that's where I think if there is the Jewish sect of this congregation, which is one of the reasons why Paul is writing to them, the, the consternation that was going on, the difficulties, the clashing that was going on between Jew and Gentile, the Jews here in this congregation, when they hear law of God, what do they think? Not law in creation or conscience, but law in covenant. Because God made a covenant with Israel, which makes their disobedience that much more heinous because God showed him who he was through his word. So Paul says here, hey, anybody who knows law, I'm about to make an analogy. So you get that there's a law, and let me say this to you. I'm speaking to those who know law that the law is binding on a person only as he lives. Thanks, Paul. I I don't think anybody assumes differently. Nobody is thinking, you know, weekend at Bernie's that there are dead people walking around that are committing crimes and they're going to be charged and taken to prison. Why? That would be foolish. This person's dead. Why, why would we even make this statement, Paul? Because he's about to make an analogy very similar to chapter 6. That if you want there to be a change of authority in a law, something cataclysmic has to happen. And if you're alive, you are held accountable to the law that you're in. Once a death has taken place... Now no longer is that law in authority. And so he sets that up for verse two. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. Paul's gonna begin to move away from the analogy of slavery to the description of the Christian life being a marriage between you and Christ. And when you understand that relationship, temptation towards the law as a ruler or the source of power in your life will not come because you realize you are under the authority of a new husband, that of Jesus Christ. So number one in your outline, write it down this way. If we want to grow in that, make sure we never tend towards legalism or lawlessness, but we stay under the lordship of Christ. Number one, cultivate a covenantal jealousy. Cultivate a covenantal jealousy. Jealousy is an interesting concept, isn't it? but it's one that the scriptures are replete with. Men, I hope you remember that as we started the the zealous idea of being a zealous man, great to spend time yesterday with a bunch of guys who are passionate about being zealous for the glory of God. That word zeal and jealousy are the same one. They're just translated differently from time to time, but it is this ardent passion, effort, and emotion that you have towards an object or a person. But the reason why we say covenantal jealousy is because we know and understand as people, there is what the Bible describes bitter jealousy, where we're selfish towards things that are ours and mine, and I deserve this. But a covenantal jealousy is driven by another person. And that's what you have in a 
marriage. This is why Paul is hitting on this issue right now. Not only did we learn that as slaves, we are bound by our desire to be doxologically defiant towards sin because it's our old master and doxologically devoted to God because he's our new one. Now we have this relationship to Jesus Christ where he is an authority over us and it is not the law. Notice how he finishes the argument. A woman's bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Can you look back up to verse one? Notice what it says there. The law is binding on a person. You see that phrase? The law is binding on a person. If you have the ESV, the law is binding. You know what that word binding is? It's the word for lordship. Where did we see that before? Look at chapter six, verse 14. For sin will have no lordship over you, no dominion over you. Sin is not binding over you anymore. Why? Because you are not under, notice this phrase again, you're not under the law. You are under grace. So Paul is saying that sin is not your master anymore. It doesn't rule over you. It can't empower you to do anything anymore because you're not under it. You're not under law. You're under grace. But notice again, Paul just throwing that phrase out there that sin is using the law of God to hold people under its power. That's an incredible statement. Paul's trying to show you the fundamental shift, that, again, that has taken place because of a death. That's what he made in chapter six as an argument. How can we who have died to sin still live in it? Now he's saying, if I was in a marriage to the law before I was saved, once I die to that, I'm no longer under that rule anymore. I'm under the rule of the new husband that I have. And that now is Jesus Christ. I love that Paul uses the analogy of marriage. You know why he does that? See the word marriage there in verse two? Marriage is uh, the word here that takes the word for husband and adds a, a preposition to the beginning of it. So a prefix. So it's the word husband and then it's the word under. So the word marriage here is under a husband. So under an authority, which men we've talked about before is God's design. Even before sin ever came into the world, you are the one who has headship over your family. And we ask you to exercise that headship as a delegated authority to be dispensed with humility. Because the only reason you have that is because God gave it to you and made you that way. You didn't earn it. You didn't accomplish it. It's a gift to steward for your family, but it's an authority nonetheless. And so he's saying the woman is under the authority. She's under a husband and she can't go to another Unless something cataclysmic happens. There is this death that breaks that relationship and now she can go under a new authority. Do you know that prefix that we have under right there is the same one back from 614 which says you are not under law, you are under grace. Paul is trying to show you the law cannot be a legalistic pursuit for you where you use it to establish your own righteousness or even uh, make yourself right before a living God. But it's also not something that you just cast aside and say, I have nothing over me. There is no authority. I'm my authority. You are under the lordship of Christ. As we'll get to see in a few weeks, there's many different times that Paul says, fulfill the law of Christ, who is now your head and who you should be following as the rule and Authority. Paul's saying this is taking place. Look at verse three. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is still alive. But if he dies, she's free from the law. And if she marries another, she will not be called an adulteress. How often does the Bible use the subject of adultery to describe what men do and women do when they worship anything else other than God. It's ubiquitous everywhere. God, why would you do that? Paul, why would you write this? Why do you take something that is so heinous and cowardly and destructive and selfish as adultery and use it as an example? Paul, don't you understand 
how hurtful and harmful this thought is. And that's exactly why Paul uses it and God uses it. If you talk to anybody who has been cheated on and the betrayal that is there, God, one of the reasons he gives us marriage, one is to picture the gospel, which we'll talk about in a moment, but two, to be able to understand what God is saying and why he has righteous wrath. Because if I say I'm devoted to God and then I give my devotion to another, the Bible describes that as spiritual adultery. Do you feel uncomfortable right now? You should. Because if you are tempted towards anything else and you think it's okay to flirt with it, what are you doing? God has a divine jealousy for you. His nature is that he is jealous. Exodus, Joshua, describe God as a jealous God. And why is God allowed to be jealous? Because he alone is worthy. And for you to take that worship that belongs only to him and point it any other direction is like adultery. Why is the analogy of marriage so helpful? Because the unique, undivided, singular devotion that protects a marriage is the same thing that will protect your Christian walk. The unique, undivided, singular focus that you have towards God. God is jealous for you. James 4 says that. He has jealous over the spirit that he has made within you. God rightfully is jealous over you. I'm asking you this question. Do you have a covenantal jealousy for the name of God? He is jealous for you. Are you just as zealous to protect the relationship you say you have with him like a husband and wife should be? If you're married right now, consider this option. If you walked down the aisle and the the pastor was there before you and he looked at you and he said, all right, I've got vows for you. He's talking to the wife. I've got vows for you from the husband here. And he says, I promise 25% of the time I will be faithful to you. There's 25% you don't get of my life. 75, I think that's a pretty fair deal. Is any woman in the world who understands her worth in the image of God going to say, oh, that's a deal I'm going to take. 75% of the time, that's most of his time. 25% they can do what they want. Do you think God accepts that? Why do you act like it? Why? Why aren't you just as jealous as he is for you for his name? There is a jealousy you must have. Undivided, unique, singular focus to the one that you're in this covenantal relationship with. And listen to how he describes it. Verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you've died to the law. Now, please stop right there and don't try to make one-to-one correspondence to what Paul's trying to say here because he's not trying to make every aspect of the analogy fit. All he wants you to remember is that if there is a change in the authority over a person, it will be when a death takes place. That's the argument he made in six. That's the argument he's making here in seven. But now he's changed it to a husband and wife. So now he's saying, you've died to the law, which means you are no longer obligated under its authority, its empowerment of you to do the things that are dishonoring to God. You've died to the law through the body of Christ. Jesus' physical body. Do you remember, Christianity is not Gnostic. A human person named Jesus, 100% flesh and blood, suffered on a cross for you and he bore that for you because he was jealous for you and then it says this so that we might belong to another isn't that just a beautiful phrase we might belong to another he's using that same word that he just used to describe how it is to become married to another person you belong To Jesus. If you remember old hymns, I love the old hymn. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. You belong to Christ in a covenantal relationship, which means 
we don't flirt with anybody else. We don't give our attention to anybody else. The jealousy you should have in a marriage, which is right jealousy, is the covenantal jealousy you have to have towards God. Don't dishonor the relationship you have with him by saying, 50% of my time's good. 65, I think that's a fair deal, God. He's not into that. He's divinely jealous for you, and he wants you to be covenantally jealous towards his name. Can you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11? We want to cultivate this. 2 Corinthians 11. Paul uses this analogy with the Corinthians, and he does so so effectively. If you think this isn't a big deal, that it doesn't need to be preached in churches, read the book of 1 Corinthians, because the, first, the book of 1 Corinthians has Paul over and over again essentially saying to the Corinthians, you are falling and flirting with the wrong people. Chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians says, you would join yourself to a prostitute and think you can call yourself a believer? No, you're in union with Christ. You cannot do that. You're in that covenantal relationship. And to say that I can continue to do that and not repent of it means I don't have a relationship with him at all. But then in 2 Corinthians, we see that ministered to the Corinthians and they repented. But now, false teaching's coming in. Notice 2 Corinthians 11, verse two and three. Paul says this, I feel a divine jealousy for you. Why does Paul feel a divine jealousy? Because I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin in Christ. When we talk about the subject of marriage, we have to think about the subject of covenants and what is being promised and offered. And Paul, probably here from the position of the father of a bride who betroths a daughter to a man and his son so that they will be married, will make the betrothal and then between the betrothal and the time that they get married, the father will zealously guard the purity of the daughter. And if you are a dad worth your salt, you will do so passionately because you understand what it means to be devoted to another person. Paul says, I feel that towards you, Corinthians. Do you guys understand the, the hurts and harms that come into pastoral ministry? Or because we're put in this position over you. So you think our job might be easy. It's not. What it is is to care enough for you to say, I'm presenting you to Christ so that you don't have any allurements or enticements to anything that would cause you to be taken from what the Bible says is a pure and undefiled focus towards Jesus. That's a divine jealousy. And I'm going to passionately guard it. Notice what he said, verse 3. I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So that's the temptation that every believer faces. If you're here right now in Christ, what does Satan want more than anything? If we were in chapter 6, it would be to think that you are enslaved to what? was your former master. That's a lie, and we understand our new master. Now what is his enticement? That there is something more alluring, more engaging, more full of pleasure outside the relationship you promised to remain pure and focused towards. That's what he wants you to believe, and it is a lie from the pit of hell. I'm afraid that as the, the, ser the serpent deceived Eve... What did he have to do to Eve to deceive her? Say these words, has God said is all it took. You think I'm up here, you know, making a performance. Those words were all it took in the Garden of Eden with perfection around them for Eve to go, yeah, I'd like something other than this relationship with God. All it took has God said, do you want to develop a covenantal loyalty to God? You must be devoted to his word. How do we know that? What did Jesus do 
when the siren song of temptation came to allure him away from his devotion to God. What did he say? This is what God has said. So Jesus was united with his relationship to God, fully focused on it, because he knew the word. And whatever lies the devil wants to bring in, and notice again the mindset, the lies he's bringing in are in your thoughts. So when I tell you Christianity is about your mind and your ability to reason biblically in order to not only fight temptation, but to do so faithfully so God gets the glory, it's not hyperbole. This is life or death. And you have the choice each day. That's what Romans 6 was about. It's the same thing in your marriage. Paul's saying, I have this divine jealousy for you. A sincere and pure devotion to Christ is what we must have. So how do you cultivate that? I want to give you just three quick D's, okay? Three D's. Sounds like my report card in high school. Three D's, okay? Three D's going on there. You have to make sure and understand that relationships must constantly be developed. That's the first D. Relationships are not stagnant. If you think that your marriage is going to survive because you promised at your wedding day and then you don't develop that relationship later on, what you will watch happen is the promise was made, feelings feel good right now, and the moment feelings are hurt, people walk away from their promise and don't do what they said, and then they end up in divorce. What will happen is I'm going to develop the relationship. How do you do that? Time, right? It takes time. You spending time with your spouse. Like me, if I don't spend time with my spouse, talking and communicating and asking how she's doing, praying with her, being on the same page, going out on date nights, if I'm not spending time with this person, nothing is being developed. And now you see why busyness is one of the greatest enemies that a Christian can have. I want to be highly productive for the glory of God, but busyness can stop me from developing the things I need to develop. Am I so busy that I don't spend time with God, who I'm in a covenantal relationship, Jesus Christ, each and every day? Why do you think you are tempted to go outside the covenant you promised? Because there's no development. Secondly, Delight, grow in your delight, right? Enjoy one another. It is a precious gift from God. I can only imagine between a husband and a wife, if I were trying to encourage them, hey, go out and and develop your relationship. If you develop the relationship and you purely did it out of a sense of duty where I'm just doing this because I'm being told and there was no development of delight between the two of you, that would be dishonoring to the other person in the relationship, It takes work, yes, but it should be work that increases in the delight of the object. And if it's just simply duty over and over again, chances are you're back under the old master, which is the law, and you're not understanding the relationship you have with God that's under grace. So you've got to develop it, work at it, got to delight in it. And number three, you have to defend it. If you're in covenant, there is this aspect of defending it. Men, that's what we spoke about yesterday. If you were in our section of the scenario that I laid out, do you remember we were talking about very weighty issues that you're going to walk through in the culture? And the Bible absolutely says we should be gracious, we should be wise, we should be winsome, we should be uh, wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, all those things. But when it comes to protecting a covenant, we don't mess around. If you come at my wife and you flirt with her, I'm not going to be winsome at all. It will not be fun for you. Do you know why I have five sons? I'm going to send them after you, okay? (laughs) I'm not going to do it myself. I've got my henchmen to do my dirty work. That's why I have five boys. It's just a sign of like, (laughs) and they know where to go. Trenton has a mean left hook. He's a lefty. And Hudson, he's tiny and scrawny. But man, can he bite an ankle, right? Like I'm just going to send him and they're going to defend the covenant. Do you defend the covenant? God saved you and you're going to flirt with something else that cannot happen if you have jealousy. You would never accept that in a marriage. Why do you think God is going to do it? 
he is jealous for you. Are you covenantally jealous towards him? That's what Paul's saying. Now go back to Romans chapter seven and look at this beautiful promise that you have. He says that you may belong to another. You belong to Christ. We don't have time. Ephesians 25, 22 to 33. That's the relationship that the church has with Christ. He's our head. He's our husband. He's died for us. He loves us to make us holy and blameless. But then notice this phrase right there. We belong to him. To who? To him who has been raised from the dead. When is the last time you were thankful for the resurrection? Was it on Easter? Because that's not good enough. Remember I said each and every day, you're reminded that you need power from God. And it's only because he's resurrected from the dead that these promises work. The one who has been raised from the dead, meaning he's conquered death. And in Romans 6, it says, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died once for all. So what does that mean? If there can be a transfer of authority when a death takes place, but I'm now in covenantal relationship to the one who will never die again, there's security, there's peace, there's hope that nothing else offers because it's all temporary. But we have a covenantal relationship with the one who conquered death. That's power. And that's where it comes from. But notice where Paul goes at the end of this. This is why you have a covenantal relationship. Look at these words with me. In order that we may bear fruit for God. That is a profound statement. Number two on your outline, write it down this way. Devote yourself to the dependent production of God honoring fruit. Devote yourself to the dependent production of God honoring fruit. The point of the marriage analogy is to speak of the unique, undivided, singular focus that a covenantal relationship demands, okay? But we do not stop there and just think, how great is this relationship? But we realize, what is the purpose of this relationship? And I need you to hear me very clearly right now. What I'm about to say to you is not Pastor Elliot's opinion on the Christian life. This is not Compass Bible Church's stance on a relationship with God. This is the God of the universe and the way he describes a covenantal relationship with any human. It is not that you get saved and you sit and enjoy the benefits. The reason for the union that has taken place in the covenant is that we might bear fruit for God. That is not legalistic. That is not us laying some burden on you that's pharisaical. That is God's design in your life that you bear fruit for God. So don't say I have a relationship with him if I'm not bearing the fruit that he tells me I should be bearing. This is what the scriptures say. I'm dependent upon him in the power of the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit Why is Galatians 5 tell us the fruit of the law? No, fruit of the spirit. Because when the spirit's there, there will be this production of fruit. Guys, is this the first time Paul's talked about this? Should we be shocked? No. What did he say at the end of chapter 6? He said, you have one of two options. You will be a slave to sin, slave to God, and both of those will produce fruit. So everybody in here, whether you're saved or not, is going to produce fruit. There will be a production of something, a development of something, an end goal, a byproduct that comes from whatever relationship you have to whatever master you serve or whatever husband you're married to. And the Bible says that if you're married to Christ, what will happen is there will be fruit to God. Now, some commentators want to say this is where that marriage analogy breaks down and stops. I don't think so. I think fruit can be seen in the godly offspring that should come from you being faithful to God. What is the great commission but us going into the world to preach the gospel to sinners who are dead in their trespasses and sins so they might come to realization by the grace of God, receive him as their Lord and Savior, 
and come into the family of God to increase. So the two types of fruit that we are aiming for, especially here at Compass Bible Church, listen to this, is outward fruit. You can write that down. Just write down outward fruit. Write down outward fruit and write Colossians 1, 6 after it. We won't turn there. We don't have time. We want outward fruit. Compass Bible Church, we are upward, inward, and outward. One of the reasons we go out into the community is to see fruit produce, evangelistic fruit that comes. Like Pastor Matt said, that's one of the the themes of the Great Commission. So outward fruit. And Colossians 1, 6 says that the gospel goes into the world and it bears fruit and increases. Why were we at Tiller Days a few weeks ago? Because we want to see fruit. If you sit there and complain that we do too many outreaches, I would say to you, do you want to see fruit? We had a woman here last service who a few years ago was invited to a carnival at one of our churches. She showed up unsaved, invited by an unbeliever, but found the people there nice enough to come back the next week and then to come back the week after and then to repent and put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's why we do these events, because we want to see fruit. Last week, Pastor Matt had a visitor to his high school ministry from Tiller Days because somebody handed them a card that said, hey, do you go to church anywhere? They didn't. And the parents go, I think it'd be a good idea for this kid to learn. And if you're here today, that's awesome. I don't know if they're out there. But they came and they said they'd come again the next week which is what we want. We want to see fruit because people out there are going to hell if we don't share the gospel with them. But if your church is only focused on outward fruit and not, number two, inward fruit, which is what you can write down, we want to be focused on inward fruit. And that's the maturity and the development and the growth into Christ-likeness that happens when you obey all that God commands you. So if Colossians 1.6 goes with the outward fruit, Colossians 1.10 is the inward fruit. You know what it says there? Bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. It's going back to your mind. So guys, this idea of fruitfulness is so important. Can we go to the book of Luke? Let's hear it from Jesus. Luke chapter 6. Luke 6, 43 through 45. Guys, I've been so encouraged in my own quiet time, prayer, to just go through the gospel of Luke very slowly, small paragraphs, and pray through them. If you have a very hard time being focused in your prayer time, just take a section out of the gospels and read it and pray. And guys, some of my best times have been just simply reading a verse. A few days ago, this is what I read And then I had to go pray, and I got to go pray. It says this, Luke 6, 43. No good tree bears bad fruit. Do you need motivation to pray? Start reading that verse, and then think what it means. Do I have the ability to create something good that is going to be productive unless God is in me? If you think that, you have a total misunderstanding of the Christian life and Paul in Romans and really just the rest of the Bible will show you that is an insufficient way to look at humanity. You need God. Look at this. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Look at verse 44. For each tree is known by its own fruit. I'm begging you to see that's not Pastor Elliot's opinion. That's not Compass's legalistic mindset. That's Jesus Christ telling you that every single person in here, each one, will be known by their fruit. I love when the Bible will not allow for people to sit back and go, that's an interesting concept that we can ponder together in a general, generalized, broad category. The Bible so often individualizes. James says that each person is tempted. That does not allow you to pass the buck. It forces the mirror in front of you to say, each tree, that means me, will be known by its fruit. And you know what that means? There are no excuses for the fruit that is produced. You cannot play a victim and say, that person did this to me. You cannot say the situation's too difficult. You cannot say this is not fair. 
None of that is in there. The tree will bear the fruit of the source that is connected to. And so if you bear bad fruit, it's because you are a bad tree. That's Jesus. If he gives you the spirit, you should see the production of spiritual fruit in your life. Is the spirit impotent? Does he lack omni power? No. Then why do you say this bad fruit? Not my fault. If you bear bad fruit, it is because you're a bad tree. The grace of the gospel is that God plants a new tree to be nourished and grown in relationship with him. Notice what he says. Verse 45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. That heart change we've noticed in the book of Romans only happens because God did it in you. So if you say he did it in you, it should be evident in your life. Can you go with me to Jeremiah 17? No excuses, guys. Jeremiah 17, verses five to eight. Jeremiah 17. Listen to what the prophet says here. So much about fruit in the Bible. One of your homework questions is to study the subject to just see how it is everywhere. Jeremiah 17, five to eight says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man, makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He's like a shrub in the desert. He shall not see any good come. He shall dwell in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water, sends out its roots by the stream, and does not fear when he comes, for its leaves remain green, and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. No excuses. Guys, that means, I don't know your, your, your situation when you come in here. Some of you might be experiencing the highest joys you've ever felt in your life. And you should be thankful and humbled to God like Peter, saying, God, depart from me. I'm a sinful person. I don't deserve these blessings. That might be you right now. But you could be in the utter valley of the deepest trial of your life where you don't even want to lift your head off the pillow in the morning. And the Bible says, no excuses. You will not cease to bear fruit. Is that because of the ability of the tree? Like, notice, is that what Jeremiah is saying? Like, hey, the tree is really good. Like, let me tell you about the attributes and the, the abilities of this tree to be able to do this. Or is he adamantly focused on what is available to the tree? I think he's adamantly focused on what's available. The tree is productive because of the source that it's connected to. He's like a tree planted by water. That's your relationship to God. That is the vine branch relationship in John 15 where the father is glorified because you bear much fruit. Guys, we have to take a look at our lives. And if I'm a believer, say, what fruit am I producing? And if there is bad fruit, no person will be perfect. It'd be incorrect to think, hey, I'm saying that you're always gonna produce there will, there will never be anything bad in your life. You won't, be, you won't commit a sin. That's wrong. But it does mean we take a hard look at the things that displease Jesus in our life and we get rid of them. We don't allow them to stay around. What did Jesus say? Pull out an eye, cut off a hand if you have to because you're my disciple and we have this relationship. If you'll allow me, can I use a, a selfish in, illustration? Can I use a selfish one? I'm gonna use it anyway, so it doesn't matter what you say. Use a selfish illustration. I have a friend who has um, an avocado tree. It's great to have friends who have av avocado trees because you get the benefit of all their avocados. And as I'm saying this, I actually have multiple friends who have av avocado trees. And I'm saying this to remind them that they owe me avocados. I'm just putting that in their mind. So when they walk out of here, go, oh yeah, I owe it, Pastor Elliot, avocados. So it's just a reminder for that. That's really how I got to it. But one of my friends has this beautiful avocado tree in their backyard. 
And we were sitting back there one day and he was telling me the story about it. He's like, this avocado tree was producing no fruit. There was no avocados coming from it. Like what, what was going on? And he tried to change the soil around it and he tried to do these other different things, get more sunlight. None of it worked. So he went and talked to somebody. He said, what, what should I do? And the guy who knew about the plants said this. He goes, uh, have you tried getting rid of the dead branches? So you know what he did? He went to the tree and got a saw and cut off the branches that were not productive. And do you know what happened to the tree? It became very productive. You and I owe it to God as the one who is the true vine dresser to evaluate our lives and go, is this pleasing to him? If not, it's a dead branch and you should cut it off. God's gonna do that, okay? That's the promise in John 15. I'm going to prune you that you'll bear more fruit. But do not think that's only passive. It can happen when God puts you through trials, but God can empower you with such a delight for him that you begin to evaluate your life and you go, I need to prune this away from me because it's not helping me be productive for the kingdom of God. Go back to Romans chapter seven. This is what's so great about this. In order that we may bear fruit to God. Notice the direction is theocentric and you have to remember that always. If you are producing fruit to put your abilities on display, that is not for fruit produced by God. What he's asking you to do it is to do it in the presence of God. This is the way Jesus lives his life right now. 6.10, the life that Jesus lives, he lives to God. 6.13 says, when we present ourselves, we present ourselves to God for his advantage, the advancement of his glory so that he gets the credit. And now we bear this fruit to God. But notice it's not because we're so great. Verse five, for we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Do you see that? You will bear fruit one way or the other. Life or death. What do you want to produce fruit for? Your glory or God's? And it's clear that you're going to do one or the other. But now, see the contrast, we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. This is where the power comes from not from the law, our old master, that sin used to deceive us that we were righteous. Now we are under the law of Christ and he's given us the spirit in the new covenant. So number three, write it down this way. Realize the power of the new covenant. Realize the power of the new covenant. When we realize the power of the new covenant, we understand that God is not saving us and then just throwing us out there and hoping that we produce fruits. He will get the fruit he desires. If you don't believe that, read Isaiah 5. If he doesn't get the fruit he desires, he's going to cut off a branch. He's going to get the fruit that he desires and everybody's going to produce fruit. And now we realize, okay, this is not because we're so great, but because the spirit of God has been put in us and the spirit's consuming passion is the glory of Jesus. So if the spirit is in you, you will not gratify the desires of Jesus. The flesh, the flesh is a subject that we will come to later on in Romans 8. It's everything that's antithetical to God and his glory. So we won't hit on that now, but that's what you used to live under. The law, working with the flesh, allured you away from God, which is what we'll talk about next week, how the law negatively works when we, who are sinful, try to use it to establish our own righteousness. But now we're in a new category, and the category is that of the spirit. So just write down these two references for the sake of time. We won't go there. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33, which is the promise of the new covenant, which we get to come into, which is great. And then 2 Corinthians 3, 5 and 6, which will just give you that same drastic dichotomy. The way of the spirit, which is life, and the way of the law, which is death. Who is your master? You cannot look at the law legalistically, think I'm going to live according to that. You can't toss it away lawlessly, say I'm going to do what I want. You are under the lordship of Christ, empowered by the spirit of God. And when you do that, you will live for him and produce his fruit. Can I show you one other cool connection though? 
It says, verse six, now that we're released from the law, having died to the spirit, we now, look at this phrase, we serve in the new way of the spirit. See that word serve? You know what word it is in the Greek? It comes from doulos. Doulos is slave, which is what we just spent all chapter six talking about. But the cool thing about that, I think, is this, that now every member of the Trinity has been associated with our enslavement to God. Paul starts Romans 1.1, 1, 1, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. Last week in 6.22, I am a slave of God. And now I'm enslaved in the new way of the Spirit. We serve a Trinitarian God, one in essence, three in person. And we always want to highlight that because it's what ex- it, it separates us from other religions that are monotheistic, meaning we worship one God. We worship the Trinitarian God, which means Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they are all involved in our enslavement to God. There is no way to get around it. We are all his or we're nothing at all. And when we serve in the new way of the Spirit, it's like walking in newness of life for the glory of God, like Paul said in Romans 6, 4. So what does this mean for us? It means when you wake up tomorrow morning and you go to work, just like you would never hopefully take your ring off and throw it on the dresser and say, I'm not even going to think about the covenant today. I'm going to go live how I want. You are jealously devoted to God every second of the day. And that's because we want to see production of fruit for his glory. And the only way that happens is because the spirit's given to us. And when we realize that, We will make great strides for the glory of God. Let's pray that we'd have that mindset always. Father, help us to be pleasing to you. God, it is hard um, because the flesh is there and I thank you for opportunities over the coming weeks to observe our enemy and to see the things that are antithetical to you and your glory because Father, that's what we want. We wanna see your glory which means we want the fruit produced that you promised, not the fruit that we desire, Father, because we're so allured by our temptations. We want the fruit that you promised that is satisfying and lasting and brings you glory. So help us, Father, to stay connected to you, to wanna be devoted to you in that covenantal jealousy that you have for us. Help us to always be mindful of that, God. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the body of Christ where we can encourage one another. May we do an excellent job of spurring one another on to make sure we never do anything that would dishonor the one who has loved us so well. God, we pray that even as we sing, we'd offer you gifts that are pleasing in your ear. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.